So I don't know about you guys, but uh, this, this semester seems to have um, moved quicker than others. It really does. It seems to have gone. And I, I suppose that's the case with every semester. It feels that way. But this one really has felt like it's moved um, rapidly. Uh, I was talking with a, uh, a pastor from New Orleans yesterday. Um, and he asked, me, he asked me about chapel. He asked me about the vision of chapel, my philosophy of chapel, kind of what role that I hope chapel plays in the lives of, of you guys and our community. Um, so I, I talked to him and I shared some of those things, but I continued to think about that question afterwards, long after we hung up. And, and I realized, I think chapel um, takes on secondary sort of purposes at different times throughout the year. Uh, beginning of the semester, uh, middle of the semester. And I was thinking about now, today, the, the last chapel of the semester. Um, Christmas break is, is on the horizon, but um, you have finals. And you have, <laughs> somebody's raising the roof over there at Christmas break. Um, but you have finals and, and all of the challenges and stresses that go with finals. And I thought um, chapel, this 35 minutes, uh, I think serves as a time to slow down. Um, really as, as almost a 35-minute uh, time to have permission to rest and slow down, um, to sort of release your stress a bit, to worship, and to ponder. And pondering is good. Uh, we should do more pondering, um, and not just because it is a very cool-sounding word. Uh, Proverbs talks about pondering a lot. Uh, it talks about the wisdom of pondering, of slowing down, of pondering our paths, uh, of pondering the words that we choose to speak, of pondering the things that we read, the things that we learn, the things that we choose to believe. Uh, pondering. So uh, we get to slow down for a few minutes this morning and ponder together. Uh, so we'll do that as we uh, continue in the book of Colossians. Um, we're going to stay in chapter 2, and we're just going to look at two uh, verses uh, Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. Colossians 2 reads, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Will you pray with me? Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it can hush our souls. We thank you that it feeds and nourishes us like nothing else. And we ask, Lord, that you'd be with us now. Speak to us. Give us ears that we might hear, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul has been praying for the Colossians. He's been praying uh, that they might know loving community, uh, praying that they might know the wisdom and the knowledge that's only found in Christ, uh, praying that they wouldn't be deceived or led astray. And so he comes to this therefore. Therefore, because of these things, because I've been praying for you, because I'm with you in spirit, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So we're going to slow down and we're going to ponder. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord. What does it mean to receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Now Paul uses kind of an interesting word here, an interesting verb that uh, talks about Receiving, it typically refers to the receiving of something that is delivered by tradition. Something that is given and received by tradition. We know that, that the law was passed down orally. There's tr great tradition that comes through. But one of the great things about tradition, tradition and things that are delivered by tradition um, are oftentimes the most important truths, the most important stories, the most important realities, in this case, the most important person, but the things that communities and people hold most dear. Traditions are traditions because you don't want them to be forgotten. And these, the Colossians, have received a new tradition. They have received Christ Jesus, the Lord. And when you think about your life, you may feel like you're sort of removed from tradition. Uh, but we all have traditions. Um, sometimes they're, they're sort of fun life traditions. We have in our family uh, holiday traditions. We have Christmas traditions. Uh, my wife's family, I grew up with stockings, where you fill stockings. But my wife's family is Welsh. And when we got married, uh, there were no stockings, there were shoes. So you'd put, you'd hide shoes somewhere in the house, and you'd always put the same thing in the shoes. A big apple, 
and a big orange with little Brock's candies spread around and then a small gift. So that's been part of our family's tradition. Um, we have birthday traditions uh, and we started it when the girls were very little. Um, on your birthday, you get to do anything you want. For real, like there are no limitations. Um, whatever you want to do on your birthday is what we will do. Now, when we lived in Boston, the girls were young, um, and it never turned, in any, turned into anything crazy. In Southern California, Disneyland was just 35 minutes away. Um, but uh, the girls, their tradition, what they built, we opened it up, anything you want to do, and they never wanted to do things like that. They didn't want to go to Disneyland. They didn't want to go do crazy. They wanted to hang out as a family. They wanted to go to their favorite restaurant and eat. And more often than not, we ended up back at the house watching a movie or just doing something as a family. But so we have these traditions. Um, most people have traditions. But then there are deeper traditions. There are traditions of belief and practice and habit that guide the way that we live. And when we receive Christ the Lord as our tradition, it's those traditions that must be set aside. Those traditions that dictated how we behave, what we believed, how we might have sinned. Traditions that we practiced and became habit. Those are the things that must be set aside because Christ is not just a tradition. He is Lord. I think we also know, though, that those traditions, those traditions that we uh, sometimes hold that guide our practice, um, they can remain even after we receive Christ as our tradition. Uh, if anybody's ever had a, a tick, it's, it's a horrible el illustration, I know. But, but, but ticks are horribly nasty little creatures. And uh, I used to go fishing a lot in Kansas, and they'd, they'd live in the grass, and they embed themselves in your body. And um, if you're not careful, you pull out the tick, but the head sticks in there, and then it gets infected, and, and it's nasty. Um, and traditions can be a little bit like that, um, especially sort of nastier traditions, nastier things that we use to uh, guide our lives and our practice. Um, when we have a lifetime of habit and practice, tradition, uh, that we're called to set aside, we can only do so when we rely on Christ to be our tradition. So I ask you, and I ask me as well, is Jesus my tradition? Is he yours? Has Jesus Christ become your tradition? Is he your truth? Is he your story? Is he your very reality? And is he Lord? Because it's not just here that they've received Christ Jesus as Lord. It's not that they've just accepted. It's that they've literally received a tradition that is deep and true and real and should inform every element and every aspect of theirs and our lives. Is Jesus your tradition? The tra tradition that is Jesus is maintained by the Holy Spirit, by his indwelling presence in us. He is our story. So, walk in him. Paul says, walk in him. Walk in him. Walk in him because far from being a tradition of practice, far from being a tradition that's based on ritual and habit, Jesus is a tradition that is alive. He's a person, mysterious in so many ways, but alive and real. He is our tradition and he is alive. So walk in him. And then we ask, why walk? Why does Paul say to walk in Jesus? Because walking Walking is the most basic mode of moving forward. We take steps. We walk through life. We take steps that lead us on the journey of life. When you think about life and the beginning of life, one of those early marks is the first time that you walk. You take steps out of the crib, and every, really every aspect of life is a step forward in walking. You walk into your first classroom as a child. You walk perhaps down the aisle when you get older. You walk 
into your grave. We walk. That is moving forward in life. We walk because we live, so we walk in him. And when we talk about walking, walking is such a, a, a thing that it's so easy to overlook, but think of how many different ways there are to walk. We walk with our, sometimes with our heads down, afraid of others maybe, maybe focused on self. Sometimes we walk with our eyes wide open, looking around at everything about us. Sometimes we walk with our eyes open, lusting after the things that we see, wanting them, wanting to own them, hold on to them, for them to be ours. Sometimes we appreciate them. We're grateful for them. We see them when we give God glory for them. Sometimes we walk and we hurry from one place to another. Sometimes we walk slowly. You can walk with purpose. You can walk aimlessly. You can walk in evil. You can walk in righteousness. But Paul says, walk in him. And what does that mean? What does it mean to actually walk in Christ? It's a good platitude that we could throw out. Walk in Christ. Walk in him. But what is Paul actually talking about? What does it mean to walk in Jesus? And it means a lot of things, including the fact that he is our journey. Walking in Christ he is our journey. He is every step that we will take. It means so many other things, and I want to encourage you, figure it out. What does it mean to walk in him? Figure it out. Think about it. Pray about it. Answer that question because you must answer it. It's not something that I can simply tell you what it means for you to walk in Christ but it is something you have to know the answer to. It is something that you will have to figure out in your life. What does it mean to walk in Christ? I will say this. Part of the thrust of walking in him means not walking apart from him. Hear that. Part of what it means to walk in him means not walking apart from him from him. You will walk, you will live, do both in him, for he is our truth, he is our tradition, he is the one that we have received and who has received us. So walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you are taught, and here is how you do it. Told to walk in him, and now Paul is going to tell us how we do it. Here's how you do it. Here's how walking in him is possible. You must be rooted and built up in him. You must send your roots down deep into the truth that is Jesus. And the reality is we all have roots. And we will set them somewhere. Sometimes we set the roots in healthy places. Sometimes we set our roots in places that are not so healthy. Paul says we must be rooted in Christ. And the metaphor, the metaphor is so important here. The Word of God is so beautiful and so perfect in the way that it picks the perfect metaphor. Be rooted in Christ. The roots of a tree serve to stabilize a tree. They feed the tree. They protect the tree from what goes on above. I don't know if if you've ever seen a palm tree in the midst of a massive storm. Uh, when we were in Pasadena, we'd get massive Santa Ana winds, and palm trees would, would sway, and they could bend 90 degrees without breaking. And when you look at the root system on a palm tree, the roots, they don't actually go down super deep. It's this crazy root ball that's formed and reaches in and holds on to the ground. But if you looked at like the cross-section of an oak tree, And oak, big, massive trees, they're the ones that put roots down deep and wide, way down into the ground. They feed the tree. They stabilize the tree. They hold the tree so that no matter what happens above, the tree is going to be okay. The tree is going to be solid. Paul says, put your roots in Christ. That is what it means to be established in faith. 
as they were taught, as we're taught, we must be rooted. And when we're rooted, we can face the winds, we can face the teachings that the world brings, we can face anything that comes our way and not be blown over. Rooted and built up in him, established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And then, and here's the sweet, sweet reality, those who are rooted in Christ will abound in thanksgiving. Those who are rooted in Christ will abound in thanksgiving. And I could come up with all sorts of different illustrations, but I'll, I'll tell um, someone else's story. Uh, I don't know, do any of you know Sarah Womack? A few of you? Uh, Sarah's a sophomore at Covenant. For the last, since, since August, she's been um, battling, and I might say kicking cancer's butt. Um, and she's been blogging uh, her experience. They found the cancer in August. Um, she's gone through treatment, and she uh, just now recently went through um, one of her last treatments. Uh, and she's been blogging her experience. Hear what she says, because this is an illustration of what Paul is talking about. It's alive. Early in her treatment, one of her very first blog posts that she wrote, she wrote this towards the end of it. She said, yeah, going through chemo is the heaviest burden I've ever carried. It's hard putting my own dreams on hold and being away from many of the people that I love up on that beautiful mountain that I call home. And I realize that this burden will only get heavier. Yet at the same time, being at the point where Jesus is literally all that I have left to hope and trust in has made me more free than I have ever been. Those are deep roots. After a year, well, after four, four or so months of cancer treatment, all the challenges that go with it, she wrote this the day before Thanksgiving. So just a few weeks ago, she wrote, what a crazy year it's been. But wow, do I sure have more to be thankful for this Thanksgiving than I ever have. And then she went on to write, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us. If you have a chance, go and read all of her blog posts. They're encouraging, they're challenging, they're convicting, but they are the words of a woman who is setting her roots deep in Jesus Christ, abounding in thanksgiving. And that is what it means. That's what it means to be rooted, to be able to face anything the world can throw at you and to still abound in thanksgiving. So let's continue. Let's continue to ponder. Let's ponder how we can walk in him. Let's ponder what it means to be rooted in him, and let's always be thankful because of him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you call us your own. We thank you, Lord, that you dwell inside of us. We thank you, Lord, that you give us and call us to walk in you. Please, Lord, help us to set our roots deep and firmly in you. And Lord, I pray that we might know the abounding thanksgiving that we would find only in you. Father, please bless our community. Bless our students as they study for finals. I pray, Father, that the stress would not be too much to bear. I pray, Father, that they would not be overwhelmed. Pray, Father, that their identity would not get wrapped in their studies, but it would be solidly found in you. Sustain them, we pray. Father, be with our faculty as they uh, finish up classes as they look towards grading so many things. I pray that you would continue to give them energy, continue to give them a vision and a passion to love this community and to love the students. Father, be with our administration as Christmas comes, as the next semester is, is creeping up so quickly. Pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would help us to see clearly and to follow you well. Lord, we're so grateful. We could not do this. We could not live this life without you. Bless us and be with us, we pray. In the powerful, the wonderful, the mighty, and the humbling name of Jesus. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone.